Church service of Faith Clinic Church. We are delighted to have you. Each week, Wednesdays, at 7 p.m., and Sundays, at 11 a.m., our services are streamed live. You are invited to join us online, or in person, for our weekly services. Now, join us for a service that is already in progress.
Yes, we put our hope in you.
place. Sweet Holy Spirit, we invite you to move in this place. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you are going to do. Yokes are destroyed. Burdens are removed. The anointing is released. Lives are transformed. Thank you, Father. We thank you. We thank you. Now we open ourselves up to you. Move in this place. Move in our hearts. Sanctify. Purify. Heal. Deliver. Set free. Have your own way. In your holy name we pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Somebody shout, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, it's for you today. It's for you today. Praise God. You may be seated. You may be seated. Glory, glory, glory. Well, welcome to Faith Clinic Church. Those of you who are here for the first time, and those of you who are joining us, joining us online, this is known as Easter. I like the term Resurrection Day better. This is your Resurrection Day. I want you to know that today, God is going to resurrect some things in your life. He's going to change some things. He's going to heal some things. He's going to fix some things. As we celebrate our Lord and Savior, resurrection, we have to be mindful, and I'm going to be talking about that today, of what that resurrection means to you. There's something that most believers, most churches, most denominations don't get about the resurrection and today I'm gonna to be talking to you about the power of his resurrection and do you not know that's in the Bible and I'm gonna be talking to you about the power of his resurrection are there some dead things in your life that needs to be resurrected are there some wounds in your heart that needs to be healed some things from your past that needs to be reconciled is there something you want in your future but the present is keeping you from attaining whatever that thing is. As you hear the word today, my God, your faith is going to rise. You're going to, you're going to learn to uh, understand the Lord in a whole new way. My prayer is for you. You know, Jesus said, he said, I want you to take my yoke and learn of me. And sometimes we live a life with Christ and there's some things he's trying to get us to learn that we fail to learn. And what you don't learn in life, you keep repeating. Just like a grade. You're supposed to be going to the next grade. But sometimes you haven't gotten it on the level that you're on. And so you have to keep taking the test over and over again. You have to keep getting that lesson over and over again. But I want you to know today that God wants to promote you. He wants to advance you. And he's not going to do it. Watch this. He's not going to take you somewhere you ain't ready for. But he's going to put something in your heart that makes you want to obtain it. Amos, the prophet, said, there will come a famine in the land. It ain't going to be for bread. It's going to be for the word of the Lord. When we get hungry for the things of God again as a church. When we focus on who Jesus is, not what he has, who he is to us. If I focus on who he is to me, what he has for me is going to come. So Jesus told uh, a generation of people who was searching and who was looking for God to provide for, for them, but they was going after the things of God instead of the God of the things. And so in Matthew 6 and 33, Jesus said, listen, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the things you need in life are going to be added to you. Think about that statement Jesus made. He said, if you seek first the thing, watch this, the God of the things, the kingdom of God, 
If you seek first the God of the things, what you need in your life is going to be added unto you. In my prayer this morning, my heart was heavy because I felt some depression that people are going through. Holidays to them mean depression. I don't hear from my children. I don't hear from my loved ones. I'm all alone. You may be watching the internet right now and you're just watching this program and you feel like you're all alone. And I want you to know right now, you're not all alone. God has you and he loves you. And some of you have given up on dreams that God placed in your heart, in your spirit. And God wants to resurrect those dreams. You've been praying for stuff and you stop praying for them, for those things, because it looked like it was never going to happen. God wants you to pursue those dreams. He put those goals in you. And some of you have loved ones. You've been praying for years. God saved. God changed. God feel. And God says, I have not forgotten you. I've heard your prayers. Then there are some of us who have a longing to do more for God. God, I don't just want to be a Christian. I want to be an active Christian. God, I want to be used by you. I want to serve you. And God is going to resurrect what he placed in you that has been lying dormant because he wants to do something significant in your life. So today, I'm going to share a story with you from the Bible on resurrection. And I'm going to come from it this Easter or resurrection uh, message. Is, I'm going to come from it from, uh, a different angle. You may be used to, I mean, it's like Christmas. Everybody know about the baby in the manger. Everybody know. And so we are used to it. So when we hear the story, we say, oh, it's so nice to think about that. And then so we wait till next year to hear it again. And we know about Jesus rose on the third day. And we know about him being crucified. And so it becomes, in a sense, numb to us because it's, watch this. It becomes history to us. Hear, hear what I'm saying? It becomes history to us. And we lose sight that it is his story. It's not just history. It is his story. And in his story lies your story. And I'm going to show you how important it is that you understand the power of his resurrection. Because every day as you live, every day as you walk, every day as you navigate, the power of his, of his resurrection can influence your life. It can benefit you if you don't think of resurrection as history. Something I read about and heard about when I was a kid, something I hear about every Easter but what if I made resurrection, his story, my story? What if I made his story a part of my history? Then it's a whole new meaning. And that's my prayer for you today. When you hear, now this is going to be kind of different. I am not going to speak too much on, I'm going to cover it, but I'm not going to speak too much on his resurrection. Now, how are you going to do that on Easter? Watch me. Because his resurrection was for you. And we leave it, you know, just like people, they, they go every year to Jerusalem. And, you know, it's hard to go to this year, but it's... Uh, they, they want to go to the empty tomb and they say, I walked on the streets. Jesus walked on. I was in the tomb that Jesus was in. And, on, and so we, we love the history. But he said, I didn't die for you to celebrate my death. I want you to honor it. I died so that you can live. I have come because I am the way, the truth, and the life. I love the nativity scene, but Jesus is not in no manger. Neither is he still on the cross. He got up, y'all. 
And so we're going to celebrate his resurrection. And by doing so, we're going to celebrate ours. Because I once was blind, but now I see. I once was dead, now I've been made alive. Somebody shout glory. So you get ready today to put your ears on because you are going to hear your story in his story. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for all that you've done and all that you're doing. I thank you for those who are here and those who watch watching my social media that you will use the word that I will share momentarily and you bring healing into the hearts. Somebody's past will become a celebration. Somebody's present will become full of expectation. And somebody's future will not be full of fear because they know that you hold their future in your hand. Now, Lord, as we get ready to honor you and worship you in tithes and offerings, we thank you, Lord, that you have established a way for us to serve you with all that we have, our time, our talent, and our treasure. With our time, we come to worship you. With our talent, we sing praises to your name, and we serve others. And with our treasure, we invest in your kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you say, wherever you place your treasure, there is your heart. And so, Father, we thank you that as we give our treasure, you, treasure to you today, that you will bless us, empower us, and prosper us. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen and amen. It's time now to worship God in tithes and offerings. <laughs> Listen, the slide is coming up momentarily, giving you various methods by which you can give. Those of you who, want to, who are in person and you want to give online, uh, you can do so. Uh, if not... You can uh, ask someone, if you're on the front row, ask someone in behind you to give you an envelope that's on the back of the seats. Of course, you're, if you're on one of those other rows, you can just look at the seat in front of you at the back and you can get an envelope there. Again, those of you online, the slide is coming up giving you, giving you various methods by which you can give. And I want to thank you in advance for your financial support. There are some of you who are new givers, and uh, we support, we, we, uh, rather, we're so happy that you have chosen to support this ministry, and we declare God's blessings upon your life. Amen? All right, we'll be back momentarily.
Will you stand to your feet? We have communion year round. On Easter, it's always a special time of communion. Of course, those of you who are with us on uh, Friday night, Good Friday, we have the communion with that special bread that we do. But each time, every Easter, we, Resurrection Day, is a time of celebration. And we honor God through the act of communion. Now the Bible tells us that Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he told his disciples, including Judas, who betrayed him, including Peter, who denied him, including the other ten who abandoned him. Can you sit down and break bread with somebody and you know what they're going to do against you? And you still pour your love on them? Today, as we do what Jesus asked us to do, he said, I want you to remember me through the holy act of communion. And I shared on Friday night, the communion, the word communion means kalania. It talks about intimacy. Jesus' version of kalania was a betrayal. In other words, he, sa he, says, he says to the body of Christ, you're going to be my bride. So I am having this meal with you, this ceremonial meal with you, or this bread and this drink so that you can understand that we are entering a promise. Say a promise. So every time you take, in, you take community, communion, rather, you are entering a promise, an agreement. And this agreement is saying, I'll see you later. We'll get together later. And that's why he said, I will not drink of this cup again until I can do it with you in paradise. So look at your neighbor and say, there's a cup waiting on you. Don't miss your cup. There's a cup in heaven waiting on you. It is waiting. God has a cup with your name on it. He has a seat. Watch this. He has a seat with your name on it. You don't want to miss it. Jesus sat at his seat and he broke bread and he gave to his disciples. One day in the annals of heaven, we're going to sit, on a, sit at the table. Jesus said they're going to come from the north, south, east, and west. And they're going to see Abraham and all the others. But they're going to sit there with me. And he said, I look forward to that moment. But he said, until then, will y'all just practice doing it? Will y'all rehearse? This is rehearsal, y'all. This is wedding rehearsal. <laughs> and so we might as well get jiggy with it. <laughs> God wants you to celebrate. He wants you to celebrate him. He said, when you honor my death, make sure you're celebrating your life. Because don't let my death be in vain for you. I died so that you can live. I became who God hated so you can be loved. I became who God despised so you can be gathered I gave up everything so that you can inherit all things. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for the sacrifice you made for us. As we practice this wedding ceremony, where you said, this is my body, which is given to you. I know they think they are killing me. I know they think that they are taking my life, but they're not taking my life. I have decided I have chosen to give my life for you, to you. Then he said, I want you to take and eat in honor of me. Lord Jesus, as we eat this bread today, we honor you. And we eat healing into ourselves because your word says by your stripes, we are healed. And we receive you in your holy name. Amen.
you may eat. Likewise, he took the cup. The bread is the acceptance of the relationship. The wine is the sealing of the relationship. Hear me. Before Jesus gave them the wine, he supped from it. That's why the Bible said after he had drank, he gave it to them. Why is that important? Because when a man is sitting before a woman, that he wants to be his betrothed. He said, if you drink, I'm a stranger to you now, but if you drink behind me, you become one with me. So he takes and he drinks and he set the cup in front of her. If she rejects the cup, she says, thank you for the bread, but I don't want to drink. I don't want to be one with you. I've enjoyed the visit. You may leave now. But if she take that cup and she places her lips where he placed his, and if she drink from it, then he make that promise to her. In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And when I get it together, I am going to come and receive you to myself. You go into my father's house, but you're going to, spend, you're going to be with me. You'll be with daddy too, but you're coming for me. You're, you're coming because of me. He said, so I'll be back. Today, you know what Jesus said? Wherever there's two or three gathered together in my name. What did he say? Look at your neighbor and say, he's, he's here. Yeah. He's watching you. He's reading your heart. Listen, for somebody, you're not drinking up this cup. You're not eating up the bread because you're worthy. You're eating of it because he made you worthy. So it's not about you. It's about him. Yeah. Yeah. So, Lord Jesus, we thank you. As we drink up this cup, we honor you. And we sealed the deal. We can't wait to drink of the cup with you in eternity. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You may drink. Give the Lord a hand praise. Somebody shout hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. Now I want you to take a moment while they're grabbing, taking up the cups. Just think about how much you love Jesus. Think about how good he is. Just think about him. He's worthy of your worship. He's worthy of your praise. We're so grateful to this Savior of our house. He's worthy. I love you, Jesus. You reign on the throne, for you are God and God alone. Because of you, my thousand days are gone. I can sing to you this song. Yes, yes. I just want to say that I love you more than anything. How many? Is that, is that your testimony? I love you more than anything? It's total adoration, Lord Jesus. Yes, he is. No more cloudy days. I can see. Hallelujah. I just want to say that I love you more than anything. More than anything, Lord Jesus. Love me in your arms. Yes. You are my shelter from the storm. You're my shelter. When all my friends were gone, you were right there all alone. He 
loves hearing that. Speak from your heart to him. It's you I love, Jesus. Mm. Jesus, your love, your love, your love. I want to tell you. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. I love you, Jesus. Yes. Let your heart sing it. I worship and adore With all my heart, I love you, Jesus. Yes. Lord, I love you. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Make some noise, boy. I love you. Amen. Tell your neighbor, you got to love him. I mean, he's so lovable. You can't help but love him. Glory to God. And especially on this day when we are worshiping and praising him for the sacrifice that he made for us. We will never take it for granted. It is not just history. It is his story that is ours. You may be seated. You get ready because after these commercials, I'm coming back and I'm going to share a word with you that I believe that's going to cause you to understand a lot of things about you, empower you to overcome some things, some things in your life, and make you fall even deeper in love with Jesus. Amen. We'll be right back. Every year, Christians celebrate Easter. But do you truly understand the power of Christ's resurrection for your life? He said, I have not left you. Just because you're no longer conscious of me doesn't mean I'm not there. And Jesus says, with love and kindness have I drawn. He draws us with his love. And that's how you can draw people. You can draw people. You can uh, be around somebody that is just really upset about whatever. But if you show the love of God, the love of God will begin to break that attitude down. And next thing you know, you'll see a smile on their face. And, you know, you, can, you just see a difference. With Jesus' death and his blood, that was shared. He was able to remove sin forever. So believers won't be judged by sin. If the whole world came to Jesus, they would be saved. Because the Bible says, for God so loved the world, he didn't leave nobody else. Every year, Christians celebrate Easter. But do you truly understand the power of Christ's resurrection for your life?
2,000 years ago, an event occurred that changed the world forever. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was crucified. After Jesus died, he was laid to rest in a tomb. But death, could not hold him. On the third day, he rose from the grave, conquering sin and death forever. The power of his resurrection shook the foundations of the earth. His followers witnessed his risen glory and went forth boldly to spread the greatest news the world has ever known, that Jesus Christ is alive. Today, the power of Jesus' resurrection continues transforming lives across the globe. Where there was despair, now there is hope eternal. Today, get ready. Dr. Simpson will share a life-changing message. The Lord Jesus and the power of his resurrection. As we get ready to break bread in the Word today, and we honor in this Savior who raised, was raised from the dead through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the Father loved him who loved us. I talked about on Friday night that Jesus did something called trading places. He became sin for us. He took on the judgment and the punishment of our sins. And he had no sins. An innocent man was killed by society, and which was perpetrated by the forces of darkness. And when Jesus, innocent blood, filled the earth, God's justice against humanity's sin was satisfied. But his judgment against the forces of darkness. Now here, here it is. Everyone who killed Jesus could receive, could receive forgiveness. But the forces of darkness, the, as Paul said, the angels could not be forgiven. See, we was born in sin and shaping in iniquity. Grace is only made available for those who weren't righteous. Angels was created righteous. They made, they weren't, watch this, they weren't deceived, they made choices. So Paul explained when they was asking, well, are the angels going to be safe? He said, no. They was with God forever. They was, they was made of the right stuff and chose to do the wrong thing. As a believer, Jesus came and took your place. He was made of the right stuff. He was the right stuff, did the right thing, and suffered the wrong thing. And he said, Father... All of their sins I placed on, I placed on me. Judge me for their sins so that they won't fall under no kind of judgment. We read John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he 
gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Me meaning that if you don't believe, you will perish. But God gave his son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. I, mean, I like that. It's not going to end. Then Jesus let Nicodemus in on a principle. That shows God's heart. The fact that he loves us, that's enough. And we deserve eternal damnation. But God didn't want that. So verse 17 of John 3 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn them who was the condemnable. But through me, they might be saved. So as I share the word with you today, Salvation is possible, but it's a choice. Might be saved. Deliverance and healing is possible, but it's a choice. You can believe to receive or you can reject and deny. But I believe after you hear this word today on the power of his resurrection, you're going to understand what he's done for you, who he is to you, and you're going to love him. Will you bow your heads? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for the anointing Holy Spirit released in this place to destroy yokes, God. To bring understanding, healing, revelation, and restoration. Holy Spirit, use me to convey God's will, word, and ways to your people. And help us to hear and understand. Jesus said, he that has an ear, let him hear. And Lord... We have an ear to hear. And then you said, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And so, Heavenly Father, open our ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. See that you may be, somebody shout, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Every year, Christians across the globe celebrate Easter. Despite its significance, many of them may not fully grasp the true identity of Jesus and the profound, powerful implications of his resurrection. I want to read the scripture after I give you the title of my sermon. And in this scripture, it is loaded with so much, so much information that will bring about a transformation that will cause a manifestation of God's will, purpose, and plan for our lives. So, my title today is the Lord Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Amen. The Lord Jesus and the power of his resur re resurrection. You know, I say so often that people receive Christ as Savior but not Lord. And Paul, in Romans 10, talks about the need to receive him as our Lord and Savior. See, as Savior, he saved me from my sin. As Lord, he helped me live according to God's will. As my Lord, he's my protector, my provider, and my guide. But if I only know him as a Savior, I'm going to stay in a situation where I always need saving. Rescue me. But once I understand the power of his resurrection... When I understand the person of Jesus, who he is, it changes everything. And it changed everything for a man who was once called Saul, who became Paul. And I just want to read a portion of a verse, one of the verses that dealing with something he's saying about the resurrection. And I really want you to grasp it. Philippians 3, verse 10. Here's Paul. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death. If by any means, verse 10, 11 says, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. End quote. This is so loaded. Paul, who... God used in such miraculous ways. He had a better revelation of Jesus than the 12 apostles who walked with Jesus. Paul 
sought to know the heart of God. The heart of the Lord. Over and over, he said, I want to know him. Do you want to know the Lord you serve or do you want to serve the Lord and eventually get to know him? Jesus says, take my yoke and... So we're in a relationship where we're supposed to be growing in the knowledge of him. I'm trying to figure out what we can do and can't do. Lord, it's okay for me to do this? Once I get to know him, I don't have to ask that. Amen. So, hmm, I'm about to mess with somebody here. You'll see. There was a man named Lazarus, a close friend of Jesus. He became deadly sick. Back then they had what they called a fever. And Lazarus was a close friend of Jesus. The Bible says Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So it doesn't give us all the details of their, their relationships, but Jesus had people who followed him, and Jesus had people who loved him but didn't follow him. They believed in him. They didn't follow not because they, they rejected him. They didn't follow because he didn't ask. Whenever he wanted you to follow him, he was coming. He said, come follow me. Come follow me. And a lot of people start following Jesus and they didn't stick with him because they weren't called. Their job was to believe and spread the word of Jesus. Lazarus, God is so good. God will put somebody in your life who will be your friend. Everybody needs to be your friend. And Lazarus didn't want nothing from Jesus. Matter of fact, he was a blessing to Jesus because Lazarus was rich. And we don't know. We can only speculate how they became friends, maybe from childhood or whatever. But all the Bible tells us is that Jesus, verse 5, uh, uh, John 11 chapter says, And Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So when Lazarus got sick, and Jesus, who had just escaped death because he had told him before Abraham, them, some Jews, before Abraham was, I am, he had, you know, destroyed his temple in three days, I raised it up again. And the folks weren't having none of that. They said, we know what you're saying. And so the Bible said they picked up stones and got ready to kill him. So Jesus left there, the 10th chapter of John tells us, and he went to where he knew they wouldn't go. Went, went, watch this. He looked, he went to where they wouldn't go. What, what was that? That's what John the Baptist used to preach. On the other side of Jordan. See, some folks there follow you everywhere but church. Your safest place sometimes is at the church. And so Jesus went to Lazarus, I mean to uh, the place where John the Baptist used to go and preach. And where he himself got baptized, he went back to his roots. And so he's there and he knows what's going on because the father tells him. And Mary and Martha become so concerned about their brother Lazarus. And he said, well, Jesus, he was supposed to come. What happened? He was supposed to come. And they said, you know, they tried to kill him in Jerusalem. So he, he went way out there somewhere, you know, back over there on the, the Bible says the other side of Jordan. He went on the other side of Jordan. And so he was a, between one day and two days away, depending on how fast you can run or ride. And so they took one of their fastest servants, whether he was on foot or on, by camera, we don't know. But he said, you got to go get Jesus. How many times have you needed somebody who would go and get Jesus for you? He said, well, you got to go get Jesus. And so he made his way on the other side of the Jordan where Jesus was. And he said, Jesus, this is what Martha and Mary said. Lazarus, watch this, your friend. That you love. See, sometimes you got to remind God. You know it, but you, you really remind yourself, God, you know how you love me. God, you know that I love you. So she, Lazarus can't speak for himself. The fever won't let you sleep. And you're living like you're in a daze. And so he can't 
sin for Jesus, his friend. But his sisters could, and the servants would, and they did. And Jesus, when the servant came and told him, they said, your friend, you know, won't you love? He's sick, and he's dying, and he needs your help. And Jesus thanked the servant. And he said, go ahead. Tell him I'll be, I'll be coming. And so he ran back with the good news. Hey, he said he's coming. How many times you been waiting on Jesus and you know, look at the calendar? Did he say this day over? And Jesus, where are you? And, and so they see Lazarus getting worse and worse. And they said he was coming. He said, I can see them telling the servants, go, go look, go stand on here somewhere and see. Can you see whether or not he's on his way? Perhaps we need to send somebody with a camel or something, a wagon, to bring him in a hurry because... Lazarus is fading. What do you do when something that you love is dying? What do you do when a dream is fading? What do you do when hope is evading you? What do you do? There was no hope. The strangest thing is, the Bible in verse 5 of John 11 chapter, when I was reading it, I said, that, that don't make sense. It says, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus was loved by Jesus, dearly loved. After he heard what the servant said, it then says in verse 4, Jesus said, I'll be there. And then it says, Jesus really loved them. And they're in a hurry. They need him. And you know what the verse 6 says? And Jesus stayed two more days. Huh? This is emergency. This is a 911. And you're a day or two away. And we need you right away. And the Bible says after, after the, 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 the statement is made that Jesus loved them, he said, I'm going to stay here two more days. Now, I, I know his disciples was looking and saying, I know why he's doing it. I don't blame him because if he go back, they're trying to kill him. Because he would have to go near Jerusalem to go where Lazarus lived. So I know he don't want to do that. So they understood when he stayed two days. You don't hear anybody. You don't read where anybody said, Jesus, you're not going? Because they, it's, he's doing the right thing. He's doing the small thing. Because if he goes, he'll be in danger. And I'm going to tell you, Jesus is not afraid of danger. Not when it comes to you. If God doesn't show up when you want him to, it's because he got a better time to show up. Now, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary lived in a small village called Bethany. Bethany. Revelation time. Say revelation time. Revelation time. Let's look at the name Bethany. The name Bethany. The name Bethany comes from the Hebrew word Beth, meaning house uh, and uh, unia, meaning affliction or misery. So the name Bethany literally translate to house of affliction or house of misery. <laughs> Ask your neighbor who's in your house. <laughs> yeah. Now, I don't know how that city, that village got that name, but something had to happen. It kind of reminds me of Jabez. Jabez was named after his mother's pain. But for centuries, for over a thousand years, a lot of people have been naming their children Bethany. And if it comes from love, it doesn't matter what it means here, because that ain't what you meant when you had them. <laughs> Amen? So, but don't worry, we're going to fix that up. We're going to fix it up. We're we, we going to fix that. Don't worry. It's coming. The repair, the repair team going to show up. Just hang it there. The repair team going to show up. But you need to understand that names have meaning. And so when Jesus would go to Bethany, he thought fondly of it because that was a place of joy and happiness because the people he loved was there. Even though the name meant misery, even though the name 
wasn't encouraging. This is where you're going to be afflicted and have misery. And now the disciples is thinking, no, you don't want to go to Bethany. Jesus, you know what Bethany means, right? They are trying to kill you. The best place to kill you is where affliction and pain occurs. Jerusalem is holy. So a good place to kill you is right in Bethany. The good place to kill Jesus is in Bethany. Or to afflict them, the house of affliction. Now, this is going to be encouraging to you who one day discover you have a name that means you broke. <laughs> Amen. Look at your name so you don't have to live up to that name. I told you everything is a choice. So, Martha and Mary, for the first time in their life perhaps, realized or began to experience the reality of the village name that they lived in. Because when they saw their brother suffering, their souls were afflicted. When he died, their life was miserable. So now Bethany has become the place of pain and misery. And it was all because Jesus wasn't there. So it tells me, it's, this means that regardless of your name, is Jesus is there, he changes the meaning. Right, right, but when he's absent, the meaning comes back. Right, right, yeah. Amen. If my name means loser, when Jesus come to my life, all it means is I lost the sin. <laughs> I lost the poverty, I lost the pain, glory to God. But if I leave him, I'll go, back, go right back into it. Are y'all tracking with me? That's a, tell your neighbor, it ain't over. It's, somebody say, we praying for Bethany. All right, let's, let's keep praying for Bethany. We, we're talking about the city of Bethany, right? <laughs> Yeah, let's keep Bethany in prayer. Praise God. All right. Martha and Mary had waited and hoped and prayed that Jesus would come as promised to save their brother, but he didn't. Bethany is always often a place, you know, in that time where misery was a part of life. Affliction was a part of life. I know people named Bethany <laughs> who at one time lived in misery and affliction waiting on a promise. Uh, but the wait was over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, if, if Bethany just, just hang in there, yeah. oh my God, yeah. things going to change. Yeah. Right. Amen. So James, don't let Bethany leave. <laughs> All right. So Jesus tells his disciples, hey, y'all, we, uh, we get ready to go to Bethany. And they scream, oh, no, Jesus, no, no. He said, we, got, we got to go to Bethany. He said, and it's in your Bible. He said, didn't they try to kill you? You know, being around Bethany is dangerous. Oh, we don't change, but being around Bethany is dangerous. And he says, I have to go because Lazarus is asleep. And they said, sleep? We don't need to go to Bethany now because if he's asleep, because with the fever, you couldn't sleep. Once you go to sleep, your body can heal and you can get better. So they said, we don't have to go because he's getting better, Jesus. He's all right and we're going to be all right. Jesus, the Bible said, Jesus realizing they didn't understand, he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm going to awake him. Then he said something that we don't like to hear. He said, I'm glad I ain't sure up when they wanted me to. He said it this way, I'm glad I wasn't there for your sake, because this is a faith-building moment for you. Yes. Yes. Amen. Bethany will cause you to have faith. Yes. Yes. <laughs> It will build your faith. Amen. Even being a Bethany will give you faith. Yes. <laughs> and all the Bethany's out there are going to start chirping. Yes. 
<laughs> but it's all right. You're going to love me in the end. Now, so uh, he said, let's go. Let's go back. And then Thomas, you know, down Thomas, he said, well, let's go and die with him. He's going to die. Let's go die with him. And so we're going to pick it up. Well, Jesus comes to Bethany. So look at it in verse 17 of John, the 11th chapter. It says, so when Jesus came, he found that he, Lazarus, had already been in the tomb, the grave, for four days. A day longer than Jesus himself would stay, okay? Now Bethany, say Bethany. Bethany. Say it like you love it. Bethany. Bethany. <laughs> All right. Now Bethany, say, so watch this. So now Bethany, now affliction and misery was near Jerusalem. It is, Jerusalem rep, rep, represents the temple of the church. So it is, it is good that God will place a church near your affliction and misery. Amen. You just got to go to it. Now watch this. He fought, watch this. About two miles away. Say two miles away. Two miles away. The difference between life and death was two miles. God, you can show up two miles. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, he wasn't there yet, she heard he was coming, went and met him. I'm not going to let him get to the house. I'm taking this house to him. But Mary was sitting in the house because she hadn't heard. See, there are some of you going to get a revelation that Jesus is coming and you're going to go meet him while the others are still sitting in their misery and affliction. Now, Martha said to Jesus, let's pay close attention to this. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And watch this faith. See, so we can have, in, in our misery, we can have brief faith. Look at verse 22. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Man, that, I'm telling you, when you hurt so bad and you see hope come in the room, you see life come in the room, and for a flicker, you can talk some noise. She said, I know whatever you ask God, whatever, including her brother being resurrected, whatever you ask of God, that's the only reason she'll make that statement. He will give it to you. Let's look at verse 23. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. End quote. How many times does God, does God come to you with a right now blessing and you tell him later? He came to her with a right now miracle. He said, your brother will rise again. He didn't say someday. He didn't say one day. He said, your brother will rise again. And she didn't understand. So let's see what Jesus said to make her understand. Verse 25 and 26. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Glory to God. Now, it seemed contradictory that he would say that. Because Lazarus was risen from the dead, and we know he died later. A lot, everybody Jesus rose from the dead back then are dead now. And so how could he say they would never die? Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Those who are dead, they're going to get up. And those who are alive shall never die. How is that possible? Well, Jesus changed the definition of death. Just like he changed the definition of Bethany. We'll get to that moment. The meaning. Watch this. Jesus says, I am life. You say, but you say, I'll never die. What did Jesus say about Lazarus? He didn't say he was dead. He said he was asleep. And they didn't get it. He said, okay, from your understanding, he's dead. 
But from my point of view, he's asleep. Paul says those that are asleep in Christ are going to rise again. Then he said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That means when the lights go out here, the lights come on up there. So when Jesus said you would never die, he said you ain't going down now, you're going up there. Somebody shout glory. No, he said you ain't going, no, no, you ain't going, death. Paul said death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? I'm going to tell you right now, their spirits are up there with Jesus and the body's going to be released. Oh my God. The Bible says the dead going to rise. He's talking about the body, but your spirit is with Christ. My mom and dad is in heaven right now. Your loved one who's in Christ, they're in heaven right now. So he said, oh no, no. You can't be dead with life. You in Christ, right? All that are in Christ. Now the Bible will say the dead in Christ so that you can understand what he's talking about. Because when he says sleep, you want to go wake him up. So he said, you got to understand, from your understanding, that person is dead. But know what God, knows what God said. God is not the God of the dead. Okay. He said, centuries later, after people had died, from my understanding, he said, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the God. He didn't say I was. Did y'all get that? Yes. President, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Well, how could he say that? Because they're with him. Yeah. Huh. They, yeah, they're with him. How do you think Moses was able to come down and talk, have a conversation with Jesus? How do you think Elijah was? Remember that on the mount there's a transfiguration? Yeah. They talked with Jesus. How could you talk with Jesus? Well, you, well you're in heaven. And God said, go down in time and talk on the mountain with Jesus and talk about things that's going to happen. That's in your Bible. And then y'all come back up here. Are you listening? If you don't understand eternity, you will see finite. Jesus said, we will be with him forever. When you become saved, when you get saved, the Bible says you have eternal life. It doesn't say you're going to get it. Oh, we're going to have to preach on that, I see. You mean I have eternal life? Well, if, if, if that's the only reason you can't die. You have eternal life. Oh, when I die, I'm going to have eternal Oh, you have it now. You just got this flesh in the way. Well, we, the Bible says we're going to pull off this old suit and we're going to put on a new one. We're going to get a resurrected body. But, but, but. How is that? Well, Jesus said this. I died for you, so you don't have to die. He said, I was dead, now I'm alive. Did you get that? And, I li- and then he said, I live forevermore. And now, he who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he's your life. So how can you be in life and be dead at the same time? Are you getting that? Now, death, the word death means Separation. So when the Bible speaks of death, he's talking about the spirit separating from the body. And those folks who believe you're going to go into nothingness when you die, you ain't going to feel nothing, you ain't going to know nothing, we're just going to go back to the universe, you're going to be surprised. You need to, listen. It, let's look at it hypothetically, but not. What if I'm right and you're wrong? Think about it this way. If I'm wrong believing that there's life after death, I ain't got nothing to lose. I ain't going to heaven, I ain't going to hell. But if you're wrong, what do you have to lose? Amen. So if you're a gambler, gamble right. Gamble right. <laughs> Y'all enjoying this? All right, let's, 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 let's look at this. Because I want you to understand Resurrection Day Easter is about Jesus' resurrection. But to him, it's about yours. We were dead in sin. The Bible says we were dead in sin. Now we're alive in Christ. Jesus came not to celebrate his resurrection, but the ability to resurrect you. He came to give us life. And we celebrate his resurrection, but we don't stop there. We have to understand what his resurrection means to us, the power of his resurrection. 
or we will live a powerless life, Amen. becoming victims to everything we experience in life. And we say, Lord, please come get me. He said, I gave you power to be a victor. Be a victor. Lord, I just want to get out of this world. It's so terrible. He said, that's why I made you light and salt. Yeah. So you can do something about it. Yeah. I know some of y'all understand this. I was talking about light and salt on, on uh, Friday night. Why would Jesus ask you to be salt? We say salt is, is seasons and everything else. You know what else salt does? It preserves. When I was a little boy, I used to go to the country. We call it deep woods. I used to go there because we had fire. You had to have an oven that was ran by wood, what they, what they call wood cooking oven or something like that, wood burning oven. We, we had that and all that. And with my great grandmother, who was born in 1906, I believe, 1906. And she taught me a lot of things, and I'm, I'm listening to her. And, you know, my name was Boy. That's our Boy. Go to his Boy. And she, she did, it was loving, but Boy. Boy, you got to get some meat on them bones, Boy, so I can carry more firewood. Now, watch this. My grandmother, in her environment, what she grew up with, she took stuff that, for that, today, if your gas go off, you let it go off. Some folks gonna start it there. They don't know how to start a fire. They didn't have freezers. They didn't have refrigerators. You know what they did have? Salt. My wife's mother had a hog that she was fattening up. And her stepfather, he had a smokehouse. And those of you who know about smokehouse, you take the meat and kill it, and then you put a lot of salt on it because you don't want it to spoil. And then you put it in that smokehouse. And it smells like it's done, but it's not. Salt is a preserver. Oh, y'all going to hear this? God saved you so you can help save your family. He put a word in a mother's heart so she can pray for her children. A father's heart so he can pray for his children. God said, I saved you so you can preserve you are a preserver. So when he said you're the salt of the earth, he said, don't let the world, don't let the world you can influence die around you. Don't let it decay around you. You be the seasoning. You be the influencer. You be the preserver. You said, God, what can I do? I'm, it's just one little me. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. A pound of salt, don't ask what it can do. It just go to work. And what I'm saying, if you want God to use you, just don't put salt on it. Just, how do I spread salt? Just tell people God loves them. Tell people who Jesus is. Tell people what God has done for you. Listen, you don't have to know the Bible. You are a living Bible. Tell them what Jesus did for you. He saved a wretch like me. Because people know what wretch means these days. But, but he saved a worthless person like me. If he can save me, he can save you. Listen, your salt give hope to other people. You are light. What does your light do? Your light influences, salt influences. Your light illuminates the mind of the people who have been blinded by the devil. The Bible says it this way. Satan, the God of this world system, has blinded the minds, not the eyes. He's blinded the mind of the world so that they can hear the gospel, but not receive it. See God move, but not believe it. He's so, Satan has attacked the minds of people. And he's given you a sound mind. He has not given us a spirit of fear, but a sound mind, a mind that can reason, a mind that can intellectually have a conversation and break it down to someone so they can understand it and receive it. And God says, will you be my mouth and share my word? Will you be my hands and Pray for people. Will you, will you be my feet and go to people? Will you be my eyes and see people who need who I am? That's what you've been called to do. Lord, I ain't got no gift. He said you can talk. Use the gift, gift of gab. Lord, I can't sing. He said that's, that's good. Most people you're going to run into don't, can't sing either. So what you do is y'all talk that song. Jesus is the answer for the world today. See, if you can't see it, you think you can still say it. Are you listening? So, Jesus is in Bethany. He knows he's the answer. 
He's ready to do his thing. I want to show you that Jesus will have feelings. He was all God and all man, but he was emotional. He had feelings. After Jesus talked with Mary, Martha, she goes and gets Mary, and Mary runs out, because when she heard the name Jesus, that's all she knew. And she runs to Jesus. And she says the same exact words to Jesus that Martha did, but with different meaning. You see, when Martha said, Lord, had you been here, my brother would not have died. That was an accusation. And Jesus forgave her because she was in her affliction. That's what happened in Bethany. You be in affliction. Then Mary, Mary shows up, and instead of her attacking Jesus, she says the very same words, but God look at the intent of the heart. She said, Lord, had you been here, my brother would not have died. You know what that was? That was a declaration. See, when you pray and you want to have declaration, don't, get, don't come to God with no accusation now. He, he might pardon you for a minute before he pull you here. So you, you, want, you want to understand. You, listen, we need to understand that God feels and he knows and he understands. So he didn't jump on Martha about that. He just says, you, 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 my brother would not have died if you had been. He says, you need to understand. And, but, but then she, with her hope. See, she had hope for the future, but not now. Some of us have hope for the future, but not now. He said, don't worry. Your brother's going to rise again. She said, oh, I know one day. In the last days. And he said to her the same thing he says to you right now. When you say, God, I know you can if you would, if one day, if you could. He said, I'm Jehovah Jireh. Your provider. Not a one day provider. Not a someday. I am Jehovah Jireh. I'm Jehovah Nisi, your band. And I stand before you and anybody come against you, they coming against me. I'm El Shaddai, the almighty one. No weapon form against you shall prosper. What else are you, Jesus? I am. You put, put any kind of uh, a verb behind it, any kind of adjective behind it, I am. Whatever you need, I am. So he says, I am your direction. I am. You waiting on resurrection? He, he's standing right in front of you. See, resurrection is a person. I am resurrection. God, I know one day you can hear you say, I'm healer. I'm Jehovah Rapha. The Lord who. Whoo, glory to God. Somebody shout glory. So he, he says, I am what you believe me to be. Watch this right now. See, I am is always present. God never tell you what he will be. He said, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He said, you can't get nowhere, I am is not. Yes. Yes. David said, if I make my bed, bed up in hell, I am is there. So wherever I am, I am. The I am is with me. David said, yay, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. Why? I am is with me. Man, if I know I am is with me, there's something else I need to know. I am is for me. Glory to God. He, he's for you. And if God be for you, who or what can be against you? And it don't matter. It doesn't matter. Glory to God. Somebody shout glory. So, so my Mary is saying, she's declaring by faith, had you been here? Wouldn't die. You know, he wouldn't have died. And I like what Jesus did. He treated her totally different because she came from a heart touching his heart. Hmm. God said about David, David was a huge, huge mess up. If you're a mess up today, I want you to know. I'm raising my hand. If, if you're a mess up today, I want you to know that he got a plan for mess ups. Yeah. David took another man's wife, killed a man, had a baby, got the woman pregnant, killed a man, all that. David did a lot of crazy things. He nimbled people. God told him, they told him, don't nimble. God said, don't nimble. That's mine. If you nimble it, you're saying it belongs to you. He went ahead and nimbled his army. And 70,000 men lost his, their lives because he put a pencil to something. And you know what God said about him? David is a man after my own heart. 
I said, Lord, wait a minute, God, he would, I would have him in the other books. He'll have his own history. And God says about this huge mess up. I'm telling, oh my God. God is looking for mess ups. Because people who mess up know they need to get up. And people who, watch this, and those who know they need to get up is looking up. Jesus walked, he walked to a place where somebody was having, a, their whole life had been a mess. He went to a well in Samaria, and there was a woman who was living a Bethany life. She was in misery, she was in pain. But she was in a place of pain, having to go get water in the heat of the day because of shame. Her past, was ever before her. You know you messed up when your past is in front of you? Yes. When you mess, you, if your past is in front of you, you can't see your present or your future. Your past becomes your present and your future expectation. And so she's there. And Jesus shows up and he asks her for the very thing she's looking for. He said, give me some water. And she was thirsty. See, there would be a famine in the land. There'd be a great thirst in the land and this woman was thirsty. And she looked at him and said, well, hold up. I see the clothes you got on. You're a preacher, right? You know it ain't culture. It ain't tradition for you to be talking to a woman by herself. Oh, I know it's public, but on top of that, you're a Jew, and you're asking a Samaritan for something? You wouldn't even ask a Samaritan man for something, but you are asking a lowly female for something? Jesus didn't ask her for water. For himself, because he read it so he never got it. He was saying to her, I know you're thirsty. And see, when you hear the word of God and it pricks your heart, Jesus is saying, I know you're thirsty. I'm here to help you. And so she talks to him about her life after he says to her, Woman, if you knew who it was who was talking to you. You'd be asking him for water. And that got her attention. He's a prophet and a magician. He gonna make water come up? She said, I don't see a bucket with you. Again, see, we look at things from the wrong definitions, wrong meanings. She's thinking, in order to get water, he's talking about spiritual water, her spirit, and she's thinking natural. And see, when you're thinking natural, you can miss out on the supernatural. If only you're thinking natural. So she's, uh, she says, you don't have nothing to get water with. You know, our father, uh, uh, you know, Jacob, he dug this well. This is Jacob's well. He said, yeah, I know Jacob. Jacob really wants to see my dad. And she, she said, well, give me some of this water. He said, okay, I get some water. But let's go back to the tradition now. You know, it ain't kosher for a man to give a woman a gift, anything, without her husband being present. He says, go get your husband, and then I'll give you the water. Then she told her half truth. She said, I don't have a husband. And he looked at her. You see, God already know who you are. Your suit and tie, or your churchy dress, or that nice coat, or whatever you have on, it ain't fooling God. Amen. He said, I know you don't have a husband, because you've had five. What? You've had five, and the one you have now, he ain't yours. Wow. We're talking about mess ups. Jesus is having a one on one conversation with a total mess up. She said, I perceive that you're a prophet. You know, some people know God is with you, but then they're going to put you in your place. Said, I know God is with you, but we Samaritans, y'all think. God is in y'all temple, but God is in the mountain where the law was given. That's what God is. God is in the mountain. Where I, see, sometimes we think God is where he was instead of where he's at. His presence left the mountain a long time ago and went into the Ark of the Covenant. And so the, the, the Samaritans was worshiping God in a way that God could receive. And she had hope. Watch this. She was messed up, but she had hope for resurrection. She had hope that her life would change. 
I want you to see how quickly she glossed over the fact that she'd been married five times and shacking. But she said, you Jews believe this and you Jews believe that. She said, but this, you know, the real place to worship is the mountain. He said, listen, God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then he makes a statement that should just grab all of us. He said, the Father is looking for those who will worship him in spirit and truth. Let me tell you, you mess up, God is looking for you because he knows once you get it together, you're going to worship him in spirit and in truth. You ain't got time to play no games because your whole life was a game. You want to get into the real thing. Some of us are tired of playing church and we want to get really in Christ. I don't want to play church. I want you, Jesus. I want you. And she says, she reveals her heart. She said, we know one day the Messiah is coming. And when he comes, he's going to figure this all out, whether it's in the Jewish temple or whether it's in the mountain. What she was saying, when he comes, I have hope he's going to fix me. Now, she knew, according to the law, she wasn't worthy. She should be stoned to death. But she said, I know the Messiah is going to be different than what they say about him. I, I, I have a revelation in my heart. It was the Holy Spirit pushing him. That he's going to be different. He's not going to judge me. He's not going to throw me away. He's not going to tell me I'm no good. I just have to believe because I've been with five men and they misused me. They abused me. And because a woman can divorce a man, he had to divorce her. So she had been discarded by five men. And now the other man, the sixth man, won't even marry her. He won't make it legal. He just said, we just tied together. You help me and I help you. But she was looking for the seventh man. And I'm telling you, the seventh man showed up. The seventh man would show up. See, seven is, is the number for completion and perfection. For six, six, six is, is the number of man. So she went through the whole gam gamblet of men. And she found none of them desirable. But the seventh man, when he was talking to her, she felt something. Ooh, I don't know what it was. Had her leg shaking. When she found this seventh man, she was all shook up. But she tried to play it cool. She got to play it. She, yeah, when, when, when he comes, see, misery will talk like they got it together. When he comes, he's going to fix everything. And I want you to hear this. Jesus did something he had never done. He didn't do it with Nicodemus. He hadn't plainly told his disciples yet. He told them, but they weren't hearing. She said, when the Messiah come, and he looked at her and said, I'm he. I am he. Everything in her heart, misery fled away. Affliction fled away. Bethany was changed. She, she went from Bethany to Bethia. Healing and restoration. And she said, oh my God. Everything in me is witnessing, I'm paraphrasing, that you are telling the truth. Because you told me everything. You, you only, only, only God would know that. You knew. And I feel you. See, when God talks to you, you're going to feel him. Y'all feeling him right now because he's talking to you. And she said, I'm going to tell everybody. Wait a minute. This woman got a bad reputation in town. Some of y'all want to go to school, go get a degree before you go and tell somebody about Jesus. This woman was the best person to tell a town of so-called good people about Jesus. She said, if he can save a bad person like me, a miserable person like me, afflicted person like me, he can save anybody. And she preached the first sermon. And I'm going to be sharing with that in, in a book about women in ministry because women, God don't want you silent. God, you, God gave you a voice. And you, how could you believe God can speak through a donkey but not you? To believe that, you ain't got common sense. Oh, excuse me. You don't have donkey sense. <laughs> now, now, watch, watch this. I got to close. I got to close. Uh, Jesus, she said, I'm going to tell everybody by the time the disciples was coming. And Jesus said, we're going to stay right here. You see, wherever there's a need, Jesus shows up. We're going to stay right here. And that whole town was saved because the woman went told the truth. But my point was to show you that Jesus used somebody who we would call unusable, unqualified or disqualified. Now let me bring it to a close. 
Jesus is traveling with Mary and Martha and the people who ran out of the house with Mary thinking she going to the grave and cry and they was going to go and cry with her and then there were some people that used to pay people to come and cry and they were going to earn some extra money. They were going to stand in front of their tomb and wail and wail and wail about Lazarus. Jesus don't like that. He, he understands the tradition. When Jesus came to pray for a 12-year-old girl and uh, one of the, the leaders, Jewish leaders wanted his 12-year-old daughter to ra- you know, be prayed for so she can get healed, he came to the house, and when he got there, uh, there was a bunch of people in there making noise. And the Bible said the people who were paid to cry. And they make noise, and G- Jesus walked in, and he said, hey, what's all the commotion about? The woman, the little girl ain't dead, she's asleep. Oh, sleep again. She's not dead, she's asleep. And the Bible said they begin to mock him. Who is this man? We know death when we see it. Somebody think you dead, but you just sleep. Yeah. You're about to get up. Yeah. And so, so he said, she, she's just sleep. And I want you to understand, if you let Jesus, he'll take over your house. Yeah. See, I want to tell you, Jesus is standing to your feet. Jesus is ready to give you resurrection. Yeah. And he's ready to come to your house and change some things. And then the Bible said this, Jesus looked at those folks who were making all that noise and they was in the way of his plans. And Jesus, the Bible said Jesus put them all out. That wasn't Jesus' house. But the man gave Jesus permission and Jesus said, Jesus, you want me to deal with this stuff in you in your life? You want me to deal with that fear, that anger, that resentment, that bitterness, that pain in you? You want me to deal with it? Because I will usher it out, but I need you to give me permission. Hmm. So he put them all out. Then he went and talked to the little girl. He said, little girl, I say to you, get up. And she rose and looked at him because she heard the voice of resurrection. Yeah. Whose voice are you listening to? The voice of resurrection is telling you, you, yeah, you can go finish that business you start. Yeah, you can save this relationship. Yeah, you can do this. Yeah, the voice of resurrection is speaking and is issuing out a report. And God has a simple question for you. Whose report will you believe? Somebody shout glory. glory. Now I'm going to close with this. I want y'all to see this. Jesus was going to the grave. And the people, the people. They saw the pain in his face because he was being afflicted and misery was coming. He knew what he was going to do, but he was in Bethany. And he went in Rome, do as the Romans. Went in Bethany, tried not to do it. <laughs> now, so he's there, he's there, and he, he's being afflicted. And then the Bible said, look how he loved him. He crying. He's crying. And then they said this. I thought he had power. Couldn't he have saved his friend? And the Bible said, Jesus, he groaned deeply. It hurt him. Not because he couldn't save his friends, but he was on his way to resurrect. And people was criticizing him when all he was trying to do was help. He says, I'm in, I'm in Bethany to change the meaning of Bethany. And he was looking at him and criticizing him. And if you read, let, let, let's, let's, let me see, I have that for you. Look at verse 38, verse 30. After they said that, it said, then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb, and it was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Mm. Look at your neighbor and say, move the stone. You see, when God get ready to free you, he don't want any barrier to keep you pinned in. So he will come and he'll remove away the opioids. He will move away the crack cocaine or the soul tie. That person that got you crazy or suicidal. He, he said, I want to move that away. Now watch this. Jesus could have spoke to the stone and said, move. But he said, since y'all here, use those muscles. I'm going to put those hands to work. Y'all move away the stone. Oh, glory to God. Family, you got to move away the stone for your family member. Yeah. How am I going to do that, Pastor? He said, go in the intercessory with prayer and pray that that stony heart be removed. Yeah. Lord, I, want, I don't want my mother, I want my sister, my brother to have that stony heart. So God, I'm praying that you move away the stone. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, glory. 
Now remember Martha said, anything you ask God, I know he'll do it. Yes. Let's read what she said. Verse 39. Martha, the sister of him, Lazarus, who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench. For he has been dead four days. End quote. Don't double speak. Don't tell God, I know you can, but I know you won't. Lord, I believe you will, if it's your will. Now, if I believe he will, I know it's his will. I ain't trying to believe his will. Because the fact that I believe it is his will, then I'm praying according to his will. Not sort of hoping that he kind of would do it. So he, he, said, he said, I want you to move away the stone. And then she says, oh, no. So you can see the people getting ready to move the stone. And Mary, she, she didn't say it quietly. Like Martha, rather. Martha was loud, y'all. Because she was, she, Martha was a buff. She was rough. She, when she get in her feelings, when Martha get in her feelings, she can be kind of really rough around the edges. Because Jesus was, was in her house one time and he was teaching and preaching. And Mary heard what he was saying. And Mary started doing the moonwalk. And she came back there. And she, she got there. And next thing you know, she's supposed to be cooking. She's supposed to be cleaning. But she's eating. She's feeding off of the word of God. And Martha's so busy working for God that she had forgot to worship God. And so she's doing all this stuff. She's, Martha. Mary, bring me this. The servants look. They didn't want to tell it. No snitches here. Uh, here. Here it is. Why Mary didn't bring it? Uh, she's busy right now. What is Mary doing? Mm-hmm. Mary. You see, when we busy, we think what we do, we're doing is the priority. God, won't, God make a toast to someone else to pray. And fast. Well, no, let's say, well, God told you to pray and fast. And you're praying and fasting. But you see somebody with a Whataburger. <laughs> and you say, Whataburger. Why are you eating a burger? Why are we supposed to be fasting? No, God told you to fast. Uh-huh. <laughs> you can't force God's, watch this, God's requirement on me. Amen. Amen. You need to fast because you weren't sitting at his feet. So Jesus is in there teaching, and Mary come in there in the midst. Lazarus had to be so embarrassed because women didn't do that. But Martha had money, Mary had money, and Lazarus had money. We know Mary had money because she the one that got in trouble. Judas really, he would have cussed her out if he didn't because Mary came in there while Jesus was teaching, and she took her long, beautiful hair, and so her heart in tears, and she washed Jesus' feet. And she used a nice ointment and everything. And Lazarus, not Lazarus, uh, Judas, he's smelling that ointment. He said, that's expensive. You know, there's some perfume that smells nice. And then there's some perfume. That's, that's no, no, that's Chanel 36. You know, so, <laughs> the, I know that, 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 that's expensive. Yeah. And so she, 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 she did that. And she got jumped on by Judas because, you know, he saw he could have got, he said, Lord, that's six months worth of salary there. You know, minus what he takes. But that, you know, that was six months. And Lord said, leave her alone. Leave her alone. And it was that moment that Judas got mad at Jesus. I'm going to get him. You embarrass me in front of folks. I'm embarrassing her, but you turn around and put it on me. You see, Jesus, payday is coming. Now, Jesus it's saying, take away the stone. Martha is worrying about perfume that she didn't give. Mary had put perfume on Jesus, so she know everything he do going to smell good. Yeah. Are you listening? Yeah. So Mary, Mary didn't say, don't take away because, oh, Lord, no. He, no, because she, 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 she recognized him as a sweet-smelling Savior. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, y'all got that. And so... Jesus said, Martha, didn't I tell you if you believe, you're going to see? Yeah. So Martha, you just told me you didn't believe. I spoke directly to you that he's fixing to get up. Now you're telling me that he can't get up because he messed up. But I'm a fixer of the mess ups. Yeah. And so he shut up just like he did when she came in there and, and said, make, Lord, make my sister get up and help me. 
You know how embarrassing that is? Everybody looking at you? Mary wanted to just slide under the roof, under the floor, just hide. But Jesus came to that mess up. She was, she was messing up. But Jesus came to her, her defense. I could see him walking over there, putting his hand on her shoulder. Bethany, I mean Mary. <laughs> Don't worry about it, Mary. He said, and he said to Martha, he said, Martha, you are careful about many things. The word careful there means busy and concerned or concerned and busy. You into everything. Now, it's not bad, but you got your priorities messed up. Now, Mary, who's in here with me, she's chosen the most valuable thing in this house, and that's me. And then he said something that should give you joy. And he said, and it won't be taken away from her. God said, I ain't going to let anybody take what I'm giving you. I ain't going to let that be taken away. Uh, Y'all getting this? So now Jesus is at the tomb. They take away the stone. Look at this. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. Wait, wait. You have me. You, you're praying now. Oh, before I call, he will answer. Okay. You've heard me. And I know that you always hear me. What if you pray like that? Instead of, some of us got that prayer to call, God, can you hear me now? God, can you hear me now? He said, I heard you the first time. Before you call, I went, but he said, ask and pray and keep on praying. Now watch this. He says, the reason I'm saying this is not for my benefit or yours. But said, so these people who's eavesdropping, who, who's listening, I'm praying for their sake. Y'all see that? He says, I know that you always hear me, but because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Hmm. Now, next. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. You, you have to understand, there was a lot of dead Lazarus. Jesus talked about the rich man, you know, a poor man, Lazarus. And all. So they, when resurrection calls your name, you know exactly who he's come, talking to. Thank you, Lord. you got to be able to hear the voice of resurrection. God is telling you it ain't over. Resurrection is telling you it's going to be better. It's going to be, get better. Resurrection is telling you I'm here now. You say, Lord, I'm so depressed. He said, peace is here. Joy is here. But you got to receive your resurrection. And then, look at this. Verse 44. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes on. See, people dress you up. And his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, here's the key. Loose him. And let him go. Watch this. Three instructions. Move the stone. Loose him. And get out of his way. Let him go. Are y'all listening? So watch this. You may have your grave clothes on. But resurrection going to show up. See, you've been prepared to be dead and buried. You may have been dead and buried to your family, to your friends, to your enemies, to your enemies. And God says, resurrection is here. Your dreams may be dead and buried, but resurrection is here. Now watch this. After this, the Bible said the fame of Jesus went out everywhere. And even the Pharisees and the, and, and, and the Jews who was trying to kill Jesus, they said, oh my God. He, he did something no one has ever done. He, four days, the man was dead four days. That's unheard of. And then they said, oh, we sure got to kill him now. We surely got to kill him now. What? But here's the key I want you to see. That little village called Bethany, who is known as affliction and misery, to this day is being spoken of. 
Mamas are naming their babies after their city, <laughs> their <little> village. <laughs> why, why? Because Bethany doesn't mean affliction and misery anymore. Oh, you look it up in the Hebrew, it would still say that, but Jesus has redefined it. <laughs> See, because now, watch this, after raising Lazarus from the dead, the name Bethany has been redefined. People from all over came to see Bethany. They praised what God did in Bethany. You know why? Because, because God worked his, the Lord Jesus worked his greatest miracle with Bethany. In Bethany. How you listening to me? So now, when they hear the name Bethany, they think of joy. They think of miracles. They think of, watch this, not affliction, not misery, but they think of it's possible. Anything is possible. Give God a hand, praise. God has made the name better than it be the place of miracle, joy, and resurrection. And I want you to know today, my subtitle for you today is God wants to better than you. He wants to better than better than you. <laughs> God wants to beckon to you. What do you mean? He wants to take that which was dead and make it live. He wants to take that which was broken and fix it. He wants to take the misguided life and give you a life of purpose, meaning, and direction. God says, I want to take away your hopelessness, hopelessness and give you hope. Take your sorrows away and give you joy. You know why? Because the Bible called him the morning star. And you know what the Bible says? Joy cometh in the morning. Give God a hand praise. Come on, praise him. Come on, lift your hands and thank him for what he's done. Thank him for who he is. God, we praise you. We honor you. Glory to God. Glory to God. It ain't over. Tell your neighbor it ain't over. Yes, you may have been afflicted. You may have dealt with misery, but it's not over. Woo. My God. So... You said, what do I need to do? Look, listen, this is Easter. We're going to celebrate. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your strength. Yes, yes. Y'all paying attention? Yes, yes. The Bible says the joy of the Lord is your what? Yes. And then the Bible tells us to leap for joy. Yes. So we're going to take a few minutes and we're going to leap for joy. Yes. Because if the joy of the Lord is my strength, I mean, come on, I know some of y'all been to clubs where y'all doing all this. I mean, the, doing the voo -voo, just, listen, if you can do that for that stuff that's making you tired and musty, you can do this for Jesus. So, on the count of three, I want you to leap for joy and tell God I thank you for Bethany. Are you ready? One, two, three, leap! Give him a praise! Give him a praise!
know why you praising him. Somebody else might not know, but you know what he did for you. You know how he set you free. You know how he moved the stone. Give him praise. Move the stone. Move the stone. Move the stone. Yes! Yes! Glory, glory. Praise God. Now the power of resurrection. What is the power of resurrection? It is you being raised up from sin, death, and shame and put in heaven's hall of fame. God has delivered you from affliction and misery. He has bethany you. You've been blessed by God. And he says you can live in his power. You can live in his resurrection. You can live by the power of his resurrection for your life. Guess what? You got a new story now. I got a new story! Glory to God. Hallelujah. Now I just want you to walk around and tell three people your, ch your story has changed. Come on, tell me. Your story didn't change. Come on, let's praise him. Your story has changed. Somebody ask you tomorrow morning, how you feeling? Say, I'm feeling Bethany. I'm feeling very Bethany. And if they ask you what that means, give them a link to the sermon. Give them a link to the sermon. Say, if you want to be Bethany nice, you need to go 
going to watch this sermon. Woo, glory. Now, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus was tortured. He was crucified. And he died on the cross. He became sin for us. He was separated from God for us. Yes, separated. Remember, I said the word death means separation. For the first time, the son was separated from the father. And that's why he cried on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had to be forsaken because we were. He had to become everything we were so that we can become everything he is. Today, you are God's beloved child because he became God's worst creation. Now today, the real story of Jesus is not just he died. He died for you. He became your sins. He became your failures. He became everything God hated that we was so that we become, become we could become everything God loved about him. So today, the best gift you can give Jesus is not a happy Easter or a happy resurrection. If you are not born again, the best gift you can give Christ is your life. And if you're a backslider or someone who's walked away from God, the best thing you can do is choose to be a prodigal son, a daughter, and say, I'm going back to my father's house. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer, whether you're here and online. I want everyone to bow your heads. And I want you to pray from your heart. We're going to pray two prayers in one. The sinner's prayer, known as the sinner's prayer, and the restoration prayer. Repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your beloved son, Jesus, to die for my sins. Father, I repent of every sin. And Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for cleansing me and saving me. Thank you for restoring me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Make some noise. Now, some of you who are here and some of you who watch my social media, you just had your resurrection on Resurrection Day. You have restored back to the family. Uh, you have become a member of the family. Now, I want to give you something absolutely free. Whether you're here or watching my social media, I have a special book I've written. It is called The Walk of Faith. It's an e-book. You can read it on your phone, tablet, computer, wherever you want. Absolutely free. All you have to do is email us at faithclinic77 at gmail.com and say, I want the book. They know what you're talking about. And we'll send that book right away to you. Absolutely free. Now, you're going to learn some things about God. You're going to increase your faith. You're going to learn how much God loves you and how to be the child that he wants you to be. So make sure you get that book, The Walk of Faith. Give God a great big hand praise. Now, join us this Wednesday night. Have y'all been enjoying Wednesday nights? Yeah, the Kingdom Warriors went to war against me last week. Now, we had a great time, asked some great questions. And who we have this week? Oh, Pastor Pat and her panel. So you want to make sure that you stay tuned because we are sharing some nuggets. Now, I have good news for you. All the answer, questions and answers that we're given being compiled so they can be put, put in a book. And there were some questions that didn't get 
ask that we'll be answering. So make sure that you stay tuned. Hopefully within two weeks we have a list. You'll see some things up there to make available to you. Amen. Amen. So join us this Wednesday night and be ready for a great blessing. Until next time, this is Dr. Simpson saying when God is for you, it really doesn't matter who or what is against you, you've already won. God bless you. trying to find answers that will help you with your new life as a believer? Or are you a believer trying to find solutions to struggles you are having in your faith walk? If so, we have a solution for you. The Walk of Faith, a guide for new believers is a comprehensive guide for those who recently became Christians. This book is designed to help new believers understand the fundamentals of their new faith and provides them with the tools and knowledge they need to grow in their spiritual journey. It covers topics new believers will likely seek answers to or wrestle with. This book also will help those who have been a believer for a while, but still wrestle with issues and don't know where to turn. The ebook is free. To receive your copy, email us at faithclinic77 at gmail.com and state that you would like to receive the free ebook. Place your order today.